one. Hi, I'm Jill Ettinger, Vice President of Partnerships and Distribution at Brave New Films. Unfortunately, Robert Greenwald, the director of this film, Racially Charged, was unable to make it here at the very last minute today, so I'm stepping in to host this event. Brave New Films is a nonprofit social justice media company. Our work is to create films and tell the stories that are not being told. We try to connect the dots to help people understand the critical issues facing us today. This meeting is being recorded. Misdemeanors are one of those issues. They are a major part of our incarceration system. Every year, 13 million people, primarily poor people and people of color, are oppressed by this system. The short documentary that you're about to see tells the story of misdemeanors and connects the dots between the inequities that started right after the Civil War that intentionally still exist today. You'll see how profiteering and punishment are a toxic combination built on top of racism. I want to thank our co-sponsors of today's event, the ACLU of Minnesota, We Are All Criminals, and the Minnesota Freedom Fund. All of these organizations are working hard to fight for change, both to our criminal legal system and to our perception of what it means to be criminal. So please check out their websites and find out how you can get involved. And finally, I wanna thank the many people watching on YouTube and Facebook today and those around the country who are signing up to hold free screenings of this film virtually or in person to make sure that the learnings from this film travel far and wide. We have over 300 signups for screening so far with educators, faith groups, advocacy organizations, and that number is growing. The challenge after you see the film is how to change the system. It's all too easy to keep doing the same thing in our criminal legal system, even when we know that it's racist, when the data shows us that it fails to keep us safe, and when we're spending obscene amounts of money. So please stick around after the film to hear from our incredible panelists who are working to change this. biggest misconception about misdemeanors is that they are minor. To start hearing more and more stories of voter suppression, that broke my heart. They're the ones that are using the system. My grandma was fighting for integration back in her day, and I'm fighting for the same thing now. The problem is the system is working the way it's supposed to. We're recording. All right. Sometimes I feel like my life ended that day. My car died on the side of the road. A cop walked over to my car and asked me if I needed help, and I said no. John Clark was convicted on a misdemeanor gambling charge and was forced to work on a chain gang. I just remember being pushed, like being cornered into a wall. I was just starting out life. And I didn't think I had anything to hide. Mary Gay was sentenced to 30 days, plus court costs for stealing a hat. I was arrested that evening. It was a misdemeanor. That was the beginning of the nightmare that I had to go through. Henry Nelson was arrested for using abusive language in the presence of a female and was sent off to the coal mines. He said, you're going to jail. And I'm like, what for? Misdemeanors have historically been the chump change crimes that we didn't pay attention to. I've done nothing. I've done nothing. Man, I just got beat up by the police last night. I could have lost my life. 13 million. Well, that's about 80% of all American criminal dockets. 80% of what our criminal courts do is misdemeanors. 
Got him in cuffs, look. I ain't doing nothing. The story of misdemeanors is the story of law enforcement continuing to prioritize African Americans, Mexican immigrants, uh, America's so-called criminal class. Hey, you act like I really just committed a serious crime. You did I... do something illegal. You crossed the crosswalk. You might see two or three police standing here waiting for you. Right. Cops will jump out of van anytime, anywhere. The misdemeanor system has not gotten its fair share of blame. Misdemeanors are the invidious first step in the racialization of crime in this country. Too often, arrests for minor crimes devolve into police violence and death for black and brown people. This is a really dark story. Reconstruction was an era when four million African Americans made it out of bondage and were able to achieve at really high levels. Whether it was in business, um, in, in education, um, different ways of prosperity that really threatened white supremacy. They elected many black men to positions of power. Of course, that was a sea change from how power had been exercised during slavery. And a lot of white folks just didn't like it. They were nostalgic for the old days of overt white supremacy. And so they subverted Reconstruction. If you look at misdemeanors and you track them from the Reconstruction era to modern day, you see the fingerprints everywhere of white supremacy and control of black bodies. The landowners, they had nearly lost everything. And the only way to get that back is to somehow corral the black labor force back onto the same plantations that they had once worked. The most effective way of forcing African Americans back into this condition that would be so similar to slavery was to begin to criminalize black life itself. Misdemeanor offenses for incredibly trivial or made up things, what should have been tiny penalties for non-existent offenses turn into years of people's lives. Where were you taken? I was taken out to the camps. Where did you sleep? Slept on some hay. Chain was on me. I'm being put into handcuffs. I'm being dragged into this cold space. I don't have anything to cover myself. And I'm asked to sit inside of this tiny little room and I have no idea why I'm there. Was there any jury that tried you? No, sir. Did the recorder ask you whether you wanted a lawyer? No, sir. And I thought that I would have time to talk to a court-appointed attorney so we could talk about what happened. I could ask them to get other, you know, pieces of evidence that would prove that, hey, I'm poor. It wasn't like I was trying to run off with this money. Did they furnish any copy of the charge against you? No, sir, they did not. Did they give you any opportunity to plead to any accusation? They never gave me anything at all. When they asked me how I pled, I pled no contest. I didn't understand that no contest is the same as guilty, and that I would walk away with a misdemeanor that would affect my ability to get hired. The justice system after emancipation was weaponized against black people. It perpetuated slavery by making the mechanisms of enslavement pretty much the same family separation, back-breaking labor, people having no rights. You could be sold on the steps of the courthouse that you were convicted in and given to the highest bidder. A whole separate 
criminal code that applied to African Americans was established. Many misdemeanor offenses are best understood as mechanisms of social control. They're not designed to catch dangerous or guilty people, but rather they are tools. We give them to police as additional ways of exercising their authority. Some of these laws were overtly race-based. And with others then and now, the understanding was that the laws would look race neutral, but they would be applied and enforced almost exclusively against black people. For these governments to sell prisoners into slavery, you first have to arrest lots of people. There's a big problem with that, though. There's just not enough crime for this system to work and for it to be profitable. The state governments of the South had to invent new crimes. Southern legislatures, which are essentially run by Confederates at that time, are trying to reinscribe a form of slavery through a system of laws called Black Codes. A whole category of new statutes passed in almost every Southern state that attached these enormous penalties to what were in reality very minor thefts. Those were laws and many others like it that were only ever enforced against African Americans. And so it became a way to have a basis for arresting huge numbers of black people. I don't remember much about writing the check. John Owen was caught taking six years of corn from a cornfield and was arrested under the black codes. This is $4 and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven times four is $28. So just this pile right here is how much I went to jail for. Owen was put in jail for months until he was finally tried for theft. I have a theft charge, it's theft by check. I had money in the bank, but I didn't know how long it took for checks to process. Like, I know better now. I could have donated plasma, gotten $25. Under his sentence, Owen was leased in the convict labor and sent to the chain gang where he served two years for the corn and a third year for the court costs. I was in the Hayes County Jail for a total of 45 days for $25 worth of food. Michael Brown, who was the teenager who was killed by police in Ferguson, whose death led to the explosion of the Black Lives Matter movement, he was stopped for jaywalking. He stepped off the sidewalk and was walking in the street, and there was a local criminal ordinance that made it a crime to do so. African Americans are being cited for jaywalking at three, five, ten times the rate of white pedestrians. The legislatures of the white South make it a crime to walk alongside a railroad in an era in which there are no paved roads. The easiest way for a poor person to get from one place to another is to walk alongside a railroad. That law didn't say this only applies to black people, but those were laws that were only ever enforced against African Americans. All of us engage in what would be considered to be minor crimes. And for some people, it's crossing the street at the wrong time. But if you're black or brown, then it becomes categorized as something that's criminal. So what is you I'm doing? did it use a crosswalk. All I'm trying to do is go home, man. I'm tired. I just got off of work. Nandi Kane says he was walking home from work when it happened. I felt like they were going to draw a gun out and shoot me in my back. <laughs> I'm tired of all this shit, man. Vagrancy laws were passed that essentially meant any black person who was found on the streets unemployed and couldn't show evidence of work was a criminal, a vagrant. Trespass laws originate from this idea that African Americans only belong in certain spaces and at certain times. And so they give police officers the ability, under the guise of law, to dictate where an African American person can be, what time they can be there, and how they can operate in certain spaces. 
my kids daycare was inside of one of the buildings to the um, skyway so I figured I'd take a walk find somewhere to sit down and um, wait on them to get there I'm going to New Horizons to pick up my kids I was sitting there for 10 minutes that's what when Rodolphus was standing in the train yard when he was grabbed by the sheriff's deputy Monroe stated that he had not committed any crime. Wait, wait. You're gonna go to jail. I'm not doing anything yeah. wrong. Hold on, hold on. Can you hold on. please? I'm not no, no, come on, brother. Hold on, I'm not, Can I'm you not your please? brother. This is assault. At this moment, I saw my children's daycare class and their teachers and everything um, walking past while this was happening. He took the taser and drove it into my leg. And pretty much at that point, he lost all control of the leg. The deputy later claimed that the crime committed by Dolphus was taking a 25 cent tin of fish from the lunch pail of a southern railway worker. Unable to provide any evidence to support this, the charge was changed to vagrancy. And I kept asking them what I was being charged with. They'll create false charges just to make sure that everything is perpetuated. Judge Longshore found Dolphus guilty of misdemeanor vagrancy and sentenced him to five months and 20 days of hard labor in the mines of Tennessee Coal, Iron, and Railroad. Going back to the vagrancy laws of the late 19th century, the people who make those laws have in mind another group of people for whom there is an inherent threat to their livelihood, like breaking barbecue ordinances in public parks or sleeping in dormitories that white people don't think you live there. I have every right to call the police. It allows law enforcement to regulate whether or not certain behavior for one group of people is deemed uh, criminal and another group of people uh, is just frivolous activity. Many people remember the Starbucks debacle in Philadelphia. There were two African-American men at a Starbucks. The employee had them arrested for loitering where they're clearly not engaging in that behavior. Hey, what did they get called for? Because there are two black guys sitting here meeting? Yes, I did. Loitering is a police tool of choice. It's the go-to offense that police often use to impose their authority. In the misdemeanor system, there is no conduct too minor, no act too small that the state cannot render a crime. Black people charged with a misdemeanor are 75% more likely to be locked up than white people. You have to realize that these laws didn't happen by chance. They were part of a, uh, a system to continue to oppress black bodies. Our misdemeanor system includes all kinds of offenses, and some of them can be quite serious. Domestic violence, DUI, but most of the time, we treat minor, harmless conduct as misdemeanors, traffic offenses, jaywalking, order maintenance offenses, spitting, driving on a suspended license for failure to pay a fines. And yet, these minor, meaningless misdemeanors can have terrible consequences for individuals. To understand the misdemeanor system, follow the money. The accused are paying for the judges, the prosecutors, and the, the state public made more than three and a half million dollars off phone calls. Commissary at the jail, it's a no money maker. They call it the $20 ad. I'm a family member, transferred money in jail. Pocketing leftover fee. money the from the inmates' about food thousand dollars a month in East They are sales. a controversial food vendor. Rent, the big fraud, state contract waste, and tonight. abuse. Aramark is the company that uses inmate workers. Today's system is estimated at $80 billion. The misdemeanor side of it, it is a way of saddling people with fines and fees that will put money in the pockets of the administrators of that system. The first time I got a ticket, my insurance had lapsed. So I got the speeding ticket and I got a no insurance ticket at the same time. The next time I got pulled over, I was arrested for driving with a suspended license. I paid the tickets, paid the court costs, paid my fees and fines, but they said for driving with a suspended license, the punishment for that is we're gonna suspend your license for two years. I would often have to choose between paying my inspection or my registration or paying my light bill or other bills that I had. I had to drive my car to get to work because I had a construction job. If I needed to take material to the job, I couldn't take plywood or two by fours on a bus. I felt like there was 
no way I was gonna be able to take care of the kids on my own while you were out because I didn't know how long you were gonna be in jail. This officer saw me, a young Hispanic guy driving a 63 Impala and said, you know what, that guy, he's up to something. I was trying to go to work, trying to pay bills, and he's treating me like a hardened criminal. That misdemeanor charge ended up becoming something that I couldn't get rid of. They are being treated as revenue sources charged daily fees for being in jail, supervision fees, tether fees, drug testing fees, database fees to fund bail bondsmen, private probation companies, electronic monitoring companies, drug testing companies. It is disturbingly similar to the way that we saw African-Americans being exploited in the post-war South. I'm the Mario Davis, uh, linebacker for the New Orleans Saints. I was born and raised in Mississippi, pretty much raised by a single mom. Entering into my second year of college, me and a teammate were caught shoplifting groceries from, from Walmart. It kind of felt a lot more like a drug bust than uh, <laughs> um, us having stole some groceries. The bail was set at $10,000, and you know, I didn't have $10,000. The football coaches bailed us out. A misdemeanor, you're supposed to be able to uh, be in front of the judge within 90 days. But this is not happening. This is not happening in our country. We have people who are spending seven, eight months in jail who have not even been sentenced. Cop arrested me and I was charged with the misdemeanor. The term chain gang was coined on account of the shackle worn by convict laborers. They said, okay, listen, we're gonna let you go home now, but Scram's gonna come and uh, put a monitor on you. They were taken to an anvil where a rivet was pounded into the ankle cuffs to keep them closed. Then the cuffs were chained together. The initial fee to get on the Scram was $250. That's just to have it put on. Then after that, they charged me $220 a month for the actual monitor. Many of the convicts suffered from shackle sores, ulcers where the iron ground against their skin. Gangrene and other infections were also common. Right after they put it on me, you start causing these really severe sores and rashes, and their attitude pretty much is, it's court ordered, it's by a judge, and you'll wear it, or you can go back to jail. The emaciated convict laborers worked their entire days barefoot, but the shackles were always on their ankles. They mined in them, slept in them, and those who died of disease or beatings were buried in them. What they're doing is unjust. What they're doing is profiteering because you, you're paying them. You're their slave with their shackle on your foot. I remember this hopeless feeling just overcome me. I couldn't take care of my family. The biggest misconception about misdemeanors is that they are minor. The full consequences of getting a misdemeanor can be astronomical. It hurt me for 10 years, and it completely disrupted my life. And I have been trying to figure out how to get my life back on track. This will be a part of my story for the rest of my life. When people are booked into jails for a week or a year or even a day, you just cannot avoid the trauma that's inflicted upon you. The moment you hit the jail, you don't come out of that unchanged or untouched. You witness trauma, you witness violence, and it changes you. It changes your community. 
I tried to get a job at Amazon where my roommate worked. I called to Walmart and I called to several other retail stores. I got turned away because I had a misdemeanor charge for theft. Not enough people talk about what it means to have a misdemeanor on your record. It can determine the kind of job that you get, to the kind of housing that you can qualify for, to the kind of schools that you can go to. A lot of people are harmed for life because of the smallest infractions. They're being rendered homeless. They're going without food, without medication. Their children are suffering. Due to misdemeanors, I lost my housing. Shortly after that, I lost my vehicle, which led to me losing my job. And it was just one thing after another, like, like kicks to the face. I had full custody of my children. They had to get to school. We had to sleep in the car, waking up at like four in the morning, getting to a laundry mat to make sure that they have clean school uniforms. I had worked so hard and all of that was ruined by one charge. One misdemeanor ruined my ability to get even just basic work. They can't get a job if they have to check a box that says they've been convicted of a crime. They can't even rent housing because they got poor credit when they received a ridiculous $500 speeding violation. So this system was designed both to extract from people, but also to marginalize their presence in society. It's gonna be a mass grave site. This is the dormitory. The stupid crowd, these are the beds. They right beside each other, and this is the space. Everybody just dying and getting sick and shit, like this shit is serious as fuck. Bro, you all right? Mm -mm. You want me to go get the police? No. What have you done, this bitch? You ain't gonna do nothing, bro. <laughs> this motherfucker literally in this bitch dying, bro. I don't know what to do. One of the worst places to be during this pandemic is locked up in jail. The judge never said, I'm sending you to prison to die. The same horror story is emerging of the unchecked spread of infection and inmates essentially being left to die. Now jaywalking or theft of a small amount or any sort of vagrancy type of um, behavior can lead to your incarceration and eventual contracting of the virus and death. I've been in jail for two and a half months for petty theft a nonviolent crime that carries a misdemeanor charge for the price value of um, less than $100. There's been three deaths, two being inmates, one being a guard. As far as like people who are working for the facility, they're like intertwined. They could easily be catching it. That's how one of the guards caught it. My life is in danger. These human beings aren't valued enough for us to apply the same kinds of safety measures there that we are in other sectors of society. If it wasn't already bad enough that you are booked into jail because you didn't have the money to pay the ticket and your license is suspended, that is now life-threatening to you. Sheriff's Office is now releasing nonviolent inmates as a next step in mitigating the spread of COVID-19. Hundreds of inmates have been released from Shelby County's jail in an effort to put fewer people at risk for coronavirus. A total of 38 inmates are ordered to go they were inmates. Their time is up. Now they're freed people. Because of COVID-19, thousands of misdemeanor defendants are rightly being released. It's clear that these individuals should have never been incarcerated in the first place. Um, we can tell by the fact that after these releases, we haven't seen any sort of crime wave. There's a different type of crime wave that should concern us though, and that's the crime of violence against black people post-Civil War. State violence has historically been used to intimidate 
people of color, especially black people. We see this all throughout history. Misdemeanors, they have almost nothing to do with public safety. What misdemeanors do is give police an extraordinary amount of discretion with any minor offense premised on the idea that the black man is a threat. Misdemeanors are a very specific mechanism that legalize violence toward black people and keep them in a very particular place, not just as individuals, but as an entire community of people. When we look at so many cases in history, often what started as an investigation or a claim of a petty misdemeanor offense led to police officers supported and sanctioned racial terrorism. All too often we see police exercising that terrible authority of violence against people who have only been suspected of the most minor of crimes. The problem isn't bad apple cops. The problem is the system is working the way it's supposed to. Police shot this boy outside my apartment. <laughs> they kill him. Gray appeared to be unable to walk and was screaming as he was carried, feet dragging on the ground, to a police van. I know, I know, you just saw your draw. My life could have so easily been taken in that skyway. George Floyd goes to show further that the most minor of offenses, even no offense at all, could result in death. The very purpose of racial terrorism is control, is social control. What we have seen in the killings of those accused was that misdemeanors became the gateway for police violence and murder. We are seeing decriminalization. We are seeing citations instead of arrests. We are seeing people let out of jail. We are seeing pushback against fines and fees. But at the same time, there is so much more work that needs to be done. Who defined what a misdemeanor is? The whole thing was built on exploitation, on racial violence, on building up industrial capitalism. We should not be locking up people who speed who are too poor to pay a fine or a fee, who loiter or trespass or jaywalk. Jaywalk! 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 Jaywal
They're not dangerous. They're not scary. There's never been a good reason to lock up anybody for petty offenses. Like slavery back in the day, the law itself is doing the work of oppression. The criminal law is providing the authority to arrest black people, to punish black people, to kill black people. And ultimately, the real crime is that we're black. When officers use their discretion and still choose to arrest low-level offenders instead of citing and releasing them, they are choosing to lock a human into a cage we wouldn't even put our dogs in. We got 123 people out of the Hayes County Jail yesterday. It eliminated the penalty for being caught driving with a suspended license from another two-year suspension to a 90-day suspension. Don't allow the outside world to corrupt you. Don't, don't allow the outside world to tell you who you are. I wanted to be a voice for those who are not able to be a voice for themselves. much for joining us. To the members of the press that are on this Zoom, uh, we'd love to take your questions. So please feel free to put them in the Q&A and we will get to them during this conversation. I'm now going to turn it over to our guests who will each speak to their personal experiences, what they believe is most important about this film and how it relates to the work that they're doing. Mary Moriarty is an attorney who served as the chief public defender of Hennepin County, Minnesota until 2020. During her time working for the county, she and her team shined a light on the inequities in the criminal legal system, specifically when it came to racially biased police stings and traffic stops. Mary. Thank you. So a couple of things that stood out to me, um, the, the idea that the courts have really given law enforcement uh, discretion. And one of the problems with misdemeanors is it gives 
police officers an opportunity to interact with a member of the community simply based on an officer's suspicion that a misdemeanor might have been committed. And in fact, we have something called pretext stops that the United States Supreme Court says are legal. And so all that's required is that a police officer uh, who might be following a car uh, be able to articulate something that the driver actually did, like fail to signal a turn, um, something of that nature, which everybody does. Cops will tell you if they follow somebody for long enough, they will do something like that. And then it gives the cop the opportunity to interact with that person and, and look through their car. And that is where we see a lot of Black men and women um, who have lost their lives because police officers have escalated those situations, which were really based on a suspicion of a misdemeanor. Uh, so that's extremely problematic. I, and I wanted to mention Philando Castile for a moment. Um, I, sometimes people forget that he was actually pulled over by law enforcement something like 50 times on various misdemeanors. And ultimately, as we know, he was shot and killed uh, when he was pulled over for one of those misdemeanors. So, so part of the issue here isn't even about the enforcement or the final, if somebody is convicted, it does give law enforcement way too much discretion to investigate. And I, I followed Mr. Lawley's case. Um, I watched that happen. And if you look at the video there, you can see um, other people walking by, yet the police chose to focus their attention on Mr. Lawley. Um, and that's an example of them exercising discretion, um, which we know lands uh, a lot more on Black residents. You mentioned that we, our team at the Hennepin County Public Defender's Office did do some research using the Minneapolis Police Department data dashboard. And that was about stops. And there were uh, really, really large racial disparities for people pulled over and people stopped and people searched. So, the, and there's no, um, there's all kinds of research around the country. Uh, it's very clear that police officers pull over black and brown people at a much higher rate than they do white people. There's also research that says black and brown people aren't committing more crimes than white people. Um, there's also research that they aren't caught with contraband anymore as well. So it's not a good uh, tactic or strategy and it is incredibly dangerous. The other thing I wanted to do is kind of skip to the end. You know, a misdemeanor isn't just a misdemeanor because as we know, people can be convicted of the misdemeanor and we, we saw in the film that there were fines and other consequences there. But there's something called, and it was referenced in the film, called a collateral consequence, um, which has a really misleading name. And I've been a public defender, I just retired Friday actually for 31 years, and the legislature and regulatory bodies have added so many consequences to convictions that are not really collateral because you can find it very difficult to rent an apartment, buy a house, uh, in, this, in this rental market if you have some kind of misdemeanor conviction on your record, is a landlord going to choose to rent to you? You may not be able to live in public housing with your grandmother. Um, you may not have access to certain licenses. For instance, you can't be a barber uh, with certain convictions or a PCA. And very often people aren't told that when they plead guilty to these types of offenses. And then later on, uh, they apply for some kind of license and they find out they no longer can do the career that they wanted to do because of this misdemeanor conviction. Um, and I think as the film said, there are over 9,000, I think there are even more uh, 9, 000, the 9,000 statutes for collateral consequences, which just seem to grow and grow. So that's also a huge problem. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say was when um, COVID came to the courts, um, the court in Minneapolis and Hennepin County wanted to open the court system for out of custody misdemeanors. And they wanted to open it up and make clients, public defender clients, many of whom are unfortunately black and brown, um, come to court uh, without screening. Um, and people were coming to court and they were sick. 
Um, and the people who interacted with them were our staff because the judges and clerks were behind plexiglass. And we had many discussions about that. And it was very clear that the judges um, value was more about getting people processed and not getting behind. Um, and, and that was more value to them rather than making people who may have COVID, um, who may be sick come in, who were afraid not to come in because they might get a bench warrant. So there's a huge shift that we need um, with judges uh, and prosecutors when we look towards misdemeanors. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you so much, Mary. That was um, really good to hear from you and your perspective as public defender. Um, I want to turn it over to Chris Lally right now. Uh, Chris, who is also featured in the film, experienced um, this misdemeanor system firsthand. He was waiting, as you saw in the film, to pick up his children from daycare in St. Paul when he was arrested for questioning why he was being detained. And he now uses his experience and platform to advocate for change. And Chris, love to hear your thoughts. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for having me again. Uh, so this film is just amazing. It's almost, it's, it's like watching it the first time. Every time I see it, it's just, it's amazing. But uh, I'm glad we brought this to Minnesota. Uh, for the film, for the uh, screening. There's a lot that's been going on uh, as far as, there's another death that, uh, another murder really, that just happened um, in Minneapolis, uh, Winston Smith, which was unnecessary to say the, the extreme least, right? But living in Minnesota for the better part of 20 years, my mom moved us there from Chicago in around uh, 2000. Um, and being young, I didn't really understand, but it was a culture shock. Right. And Minnesota is, is one of those places where um, the, the black population isn't even really that big. Right. There's only about three hundred thousand black people um, in Minnesota as a whole. Right. So I didn't really understand that discrepancy until I got a little older and I realized like all my friends had misdemeanors like men and women and they were all black. Right. And at a certain point, I realized it and I was like, it just, just seems like they don't want us here. And this was just like a, a gut a gut feeling, right? Like I didn't have any statistics or anything to back this up, but seeing the experiences of not only my friends, but myself, it did, like Mary said, it just seems like the system was set up to keep us in a certain predicament or situation. And ultimately it just seemed like they didn't want black people in Minnesota in general especially being from Chicago, it seemed like there was a, there's an energy when you tell people you're from Chicago and Minnesota that almost feels like when they say, oh, or maybe you should go back to Africa, you know, it, it's that type of energy or go back to Chicago. I don't think Minnesota necessarily wanted us there. And I think the laws and the police pretty much make it apparent. And then the, the Minnesota nice ideology, which is based basically smile on your face and stab you in the back um, mixed with racism is one of the most sickening things in Minnesota. If, if, if you deal, if you've dealt with it and you see it, racism mixed with Minnesota nice is a terrible thing to deal with. And then when you add legality on top of it and misdemeanors and things like that, it's, it's a horrible situation. And what happened after the Skyway incident showed me, a lot more than I had ever seen. Um, I stuck around for a while. I stayed in Minnesota and I advocated for a lot of things for Minnesota, but there were a lot of groups, so many groups, I can't even begin to list them that would, that it, basically they tried to use me for their own personal agendas with whatever they wanted to do. And I, I guess I was so naive that I really gave all of these groups my energy and my time. And it was extremely draining, but a lot of people use these situations as a way to gain more for themselves, as opposed to really trying to change the culture of Minnesota in which 
the culture of Minnesota is really, uh, you know, part of my French is shitty. Um, that's the best way I can put it. Um, but to change the culture in Minnesota would mean people would have to come together and realize what's actually happening to our people in Minnesota to change it on a higher level than just um, community. We need community action, but it, it's, it's so broad on a higher level that a lot of people aren't really paying attention to. And I think this film really shows how deep and how high this goes especially for Minnesota, because we keep hearing these stories coming out of Minnesota where it's just racially based, right? Like, it seems like Black people in Minnesota are having a really hard time. And I had to leave for myself. Um, I'm living in Georgia now, which I realized that some places aren't good for some people, right? And uh, that the change in my life when I moved down here has been exponential. Um, it's, it's everything's been going really good. But even when I tried to stay in Minnesota and work things through and and help people, it was it came to no fruition. So I really hope people see this video and see this film and understand that there's so much work that needs to be done for Minnesota to be an equitable place for black people to live. It's the second or third worst place in America <laughs> statistically for black people to live. So we we have a, a it's a tall task ahead of us to change the dynamic of how Minnesota treats its population, which five percent of it is black people, but we're still a part of the population, and we deserve to be treated with respect and dignity. All right. So I appreciate y'all for having me. I think I'll finish with that. Yeah. Of course. Thanks for that, Chris. Um, Okay, next up, we'd love to hear from uh, Irene Joe, who is a professor at UC Davis School of Law. Her research focuses on the design of the criminal process and its effect on institutional attorneys to manage overwhelming caseloads and comply with ethical requirements. And before UC Davis, uh, Professor Joe was served as a fellow for the Equal Justice Initiative of Alabama, where she represented it, represented indigent defendants in capital post-conviction litigation and children sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And as an educator, um, we'd love to hear your perspective. Yes, thank you, Jill. And thank you, Brave New Films and Robert Greenwald for creating this film. I very much appreciated the opportunity to share my perspective and expertise on the misdemeanor problem that pervades our criminal justice process as part of this documentary. And so it's really wonderful to, to see it um, live in this way. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't you know, take this moment to really thank Alexandra Natapa for writing the book, Punishment Without Crime, that inspired the documentary, um, as well as each of the system impacted people who are willing to share their painful experiences as part of this film production. Um, Every year in my first year criminal law class, uh, me and at least 50 first year law students talk about the agonizing video of Chris Lawley's pain in that Minnesota Skyway as he waited for his children and what his experience means about our criminal process. Um, we also talk about um, Chris's passion and activism and artistry afterwards and what that calls us to do as lawyers and future lawyers. So it's, it's truly an honor to have been a part of this film with him and to, to be on this panel uh, with him today. In many ways, this uh, documentary epitomizes why I became a legal academic. Um, as, as, as Jill mentioned in her introduction, I started off my career as a criminal defense attorney at the Equal Justice Initiative of Alabama, um, where I represented people on death row and children sentenced to die in prison, really, because of their life without parole sentences. And then I joined a new public defender's office in New Orleans, Louisiana, um, that was created in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. The, the energy and the expertise and the engagement on the ground in New Orleans was unique, it was awe-inspiring, and it was really encouraging. But one of the things that I noticed was the way in which the criminal court, and indeed to a degree the public defender's office, treated misdemeanor cases in comparison to how they treated felony cases. I think it's precisely because 
I came from doing death penalty work that has struck me so strongly. Perhaps if I had gone from doing death penalty work to representing clients in felony court, I wouldn't have noticed just how stark the difference in attention given to misdemeanor cases and the resulting impact of misdemeanors in the community I was fortunate enough to serve as a public defender. Um, the misdemeanor court system was so different than the system for people facing execution in Alabama. And yes, of course, death itself is different, but the racism and the classism that permeates capital punishment and calls so many attorneys, including myself, to do that kind of defense work also exists with misdemeanor cases. So seeing how dismissive judges and prosecutors were towards those facing misdemeanor charges, and as I said, to a degree, seeing the lesser emphasis public defenders um, could place on attacking those judicial and prosecutorial behaviors in comparison to how they could attack those behaviors in felony court, it all seemed you know, to me inconsistent with um, the, the system's purported dedication to equal treatment under the law. As, as the film points out, the U.S. criminal justice system is just really effective at controlling the movement and behavior of Black people. You can't spend time working in the nation's criminal courts without seeing that for a fact. Um, Black people have to exist in a space where the institutional actors of the criminal process pick them up out of their homes, out of their schools, out of their jobs, out of their communities, and transplant them into an environment where they are figuratively and literally restrained. And it renders them only able to do, as I mentioned in the documentary, certain things at certain times and in certain spaces. And misdemeanors are the most expansive power the government uses in doing that. So these so-called minor charges and minor behaviors allow and even encourage the government to intensely monitor and harass African-American people. They set these boundaries for how um, Black people are able to exist and punish any slight deviation under the color of, of these so-called uh, objective laws. And you saw that every day in misdemeanor court. For example, even the very way misdemeanor charges were handled, right? The vast majority of the misdemeanor process was handled by magistrate commissioners in New Orleans and not elected judges, right? So these commissioners did it as a second job, right? As if to emphasize how unimportant it was. Court would start in the, the late afternoon and often it was so disorganized that it would stretch to all hours of the night with little regard for the other responsibilities, be they work, family or personal, that those facing the criminal charges might have had. And, and that meant that people were just sitting in the courtroom for hours, confined to that space. And that was before the convictions that would come, right? The convictions that would lead to jail time, probation, fines that were difficult to pay, job losses, electronic monitoring, um, other surveillance. Similar problems um, exist in felony court, right, of course, but one, misdemeanor cases are a much bigger percentage of criminal court dockets than felony cases. And despite that reality, those effects in misdemeanor cases just don't get as much attention as they do in felony cases. Uh, when you hear the data and you learn the history of misdemeanor crimes, you have to see the connection in how misdemeanors are used to manage and control the very existence of people and behaviors who certain decision makers considered undesirable. And you realize quite quickly that what those decision makers thought was undesirable was Black people doing ordinary things. Right. So one of my interests as an academic is to draw attention to that, but primarily through the lens of how public defenders, who by some estimates represent about 80 percent of those facing criminal charges, can better address the systemic racism in the misdemeanor process. I have a deep love and respect for public defenders. I admire them so much. I feel honored as to be a panel, to be on this panel with two of them. You know, one, Mary Moriarty, who helped train and develop me as a public defender, right? And I remember my own commitment and dedication to my clients. And I recognize those same foundational principles in so many public defenders I worked with back then and those that I meet and speak with now as an academic. But our system of mass incarceration and turning to the penal process to further marginalize people means that public defenders are overwhelmed and they often have to make very difficult choices about what they prioritize in their legal practice. And far too often, clients charged with misdemeanor offenses suffer the consequences of those prioritization decisions. Um, we're actually coming upon the 60th anniversary of this case, Gideon versus Wainwright. That's the Supreme Court decision from 1963. Um, 
um, that's popularly considered the case that established our modern iteration of the public defender. Um, so we're coming across upon that anniversary in about two more years. Uh, there's right, there is, you know, rightly, so much attention paid to that case and what it meant for our nation and how we need to make sure the promises of Gideon are fulfilled. Most law students, and I expect the majority of public defenders, know the story of Gideon, who was charged with breaking and entering into a pool hall, writing a petition to the Supreme Court, and being vindicated in his demand and request for an attorney, and changing the course of history when it comes to how our criminal process works. But that case itself provided the right to a free attorney for defendants facing felony charges. And it wasn't until almost a decade later in 1972 that the right to counsel was extended to defendants facing misdemeanor charges in state court, right? That case was Argusinger versus Hamlin. So that means that next year is the 50th anniversary of the case establishing the right to a public defender for defendants facing misdemeanor charges. And my hope is that this documentary encourages public defenders and indeed all people to reflect on how the promises of the court decision in Argusinger still need to be fully realized. Um, I expect to see many more of my law students become public defenders over the next few years, given this moment of racial reckoning that they've all had to experience. And I'm grateful that this film will be a part of their understanding of the criminal process and, and the role that the misdemeanor system plays in exacerbating um, the racialized injustice that they are going to, to try to fight against as future public defenders. I'm glad to have been a part of it. And, and I'm, I'm very excited and, and happy that all of you were able to watch and experience it. Thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna hear next from Nadine Graves, and then we have a couple questions from the press. Um, Nadine Graves is a former public defender who has represented hundreds of people charged with criminal offenses ranging from misdemeanors to felonies. She also serves on the board for We Are All Criminals, which is an organization dedicated to challenging society's perceptions of what it means to be a criminal. Uh, Nadine would love to hear your thoughts on this film and also about the work We Are Criminals is doing. Thank you, thank you for having me. Um, I appreciate this film very much. Uh, Mary touched on a lot of points that I wanted to talk about. Um, specifically, there was mention about, um, Mary mentioned Philando Castile and how many times he was stopped. And in the film, they mention about how a lot of individuals know police officers by name because they've been inter, they've been had to encounter them in so many times. And I saw that a lot as a public defender in Hennepin County. Um, it was almost like, the, the police officers were the gang um, and the gang tax force and, and, and policing people for very low level things, um, standing around loitering. They were getting cited for trespassing. They were getting cited for um, being in a high crime area. They were stopping them. And so a lot of just harassment and social control has been happening here for too many years. Um, through We Are All Criminals, we talk about how we are all criminals in the sense that everyone has done something that is a crime. And as you see in the film, just about the smallest infraction can be a reason to have an, an encounter with the police officer. If it's driving on the road and your tires touch the white line, that gives an officer a reason to stop you. And it's a fishing expedition because if you are a person of color, they stop you, they can say they sell, smell marijuana and then they're searching through the vehicle. I've seen that too many times. Um, additionally, one of the ladies mentioned just not having money and could have donated plasma. Well, here in Minnesota, I've seen on too many body cams where the officers sit in the plasma parking lot and run the license plates to see who has a suspended license, who has a warrant. And so you know you're targeting a certain population of people who are already struggling financially and now you're going to further inconvenience them through the, a misdemeanor or whatever you can find. Um, and these are the type of cases that the misdemeanor a team were taking to trial. And it's, you know, it's frustrating that you're exerting so much energy for misdemeanor offenses that are so minor, but they're so major in a sense in how they affect the people we represented. Um, I would have people that would be incarcerated um, pre-conviction and losing housing, losing jobs, not being able to get to their children, not knowing who has their children, um, just being cut off completely because they're being inconvenienced for something very minor. Um, one story that stands out to me from a client 
he got cited for public intoxication. Um, but the funny part of where he was standing was on Nicollet Avenue, and it's this popular um, street in Minneapolis where there's a bunch of restaurants and bars, and any given day pre-pandemic, you would see at least 100 people outside at these restaurants drinking. So as he's getting detained, he's pointing at the people that are sitting there drinking, and why am I getting arrested for public intoxication or for having this bottle here when there's literally somebody there with a bottle on their table? So it, it was glaring how absurd um, the application of the law is to certain people. Um, again, through We All Criminals, we talk a lot about the collateral consequences, which Emily, or not Emily, Mary touched on earlier. Um, but sim similarly, if someone has a theft case, um, you may just think it's a small theft, no big deal. Well, that disqualifies them from jobs that are governed by Department of Human Services. So they can't work in a nursing home. They can't work in a daycare. They can't even get licensed to be a foster care provider if they have a loved one that's in the foster care system. So these misdemeanors have long lasting effects on people's lives. And um, you wonder for what reason, what is it making us any safer? It's not like it's doing any of that. And so um, I'm grateful that this film exists. I'm grateful that people are brave enough to share their stories. And because as Dr. Joe said, the public defenders have been seeing it for many, many years. Um, I'm grateful for the data that's being put out there. And I just hope that there is effective change that comes about. I know right now in Minnesota, we recently changed some legislation on driving infractions, um, uh, licensing fees. And so those are things that were used in misdemeanor courts as well, where individuals, if you didn't show up to court, your license could get suspended. And now if your license is suspended, that's another reason for an officer to pull you over. So there's small changes that are happening, um, but I would love to see more. Thank you so much. Um, we have uh, two questions. The first question I, I'd like to throw to um, Mary, who's the former Hennepin County Public Defender. The question is, Minnesota misdemeanor, this is from Randy First from Star Tribune. Uh, Minnesota misdemeanors include petty theft, public intoxication, simple assault, shoplifting, vandalism, reckless driving, indecent exposure, for example, how should such cases be handled by authorities? Um, thanks for the question, Randy. Um, you know, we, we have, it's consuming in public. Uh, we have public urination. Several years ago, we actually, our office had four jury trials on public urination and all the clients were convicted. And I remember a prosecutor asking me, why do you think that is? And I said, well, you know, maybe jurors wondered why they were wasting their time coming down uh, to hear a public urination case when um, I suspect many of us have seen public urination after Minnesota Vikings games. Uh, so it goes back to what Nadine said in terms of there, there are things, there are behaviors that people do um, that are criminalized for other people. There are behaviors that people do in public because they're unsheltered. You know, anybody who wants to drink alcohol, who has shelter can drink in their house, but just by virtue of walking down the street with an open container or consuming alcohol in public, you can be charged. And that happens to a lot of people who are unsheltered. So I, I would say we, we need to make some of these things not criminal. Why, you know, and frankly, the answer to um, public urination is to put uh, public uh, pot porta potties around. I mean, that's the issue. People don't have a place uh, to go if they're unsheltered or if they're coming from a Vikings game or something like that. So a lot of these actions don't need to be criminalized at all. Um, for some things, like you said, simple assault, uh, there would be a good way of diverting those types of cases before somebody's ever charged, uh, restorative practices before somebody's charged, because I think in this day and age, once you have a charge on your record, um, landlords can see that, jobs can see that. So I think the goal should be to keep people from coming into the system via arrest. Uh, there are also... I, I look at downtown Minneapolis and I, I'm there all the time. I feel very comfortable there, but it's pretty clear that there are a lot of people 
um, who, who don't like looking at certain behavior and who frankly are uncomfortable looking at black youth um, downtown. And you know there are businesses who will call 911 um, because somebody, you know, a group of uh, black men, youth hanging out, um, scaring people away. And, and that isn't a crime. It isn't a crime to be a black youth and to be in downtown. So a lot of these are social issues that have to do with others um, that should not be criminalized. And we should not allow police officers um, to be interacting with uh, people who are who have just as right to be downtown as anybody else. Most of the crimes that you put up there are also something that happens because people have a need, like theft. A lot of people steal food, like we saw in the film. Um, or, you know, we see people steal baby formula, diapers, stuff like that. People who steal a misdemeanor amount of thing don't need to be in the system. So I think uh, we can make many of those not criminal. They don't need to be criminal. We can also be much more creative in diverting uh, people who are accused of those types of crimes by not charging them, by sending them to diversion programs uh, or by uh, doing restorative justice practices, which I think would, I know would be much more effective than what we do now, because a lot of times police will book somebody in downtown on a what's called a probable cause hold, and they'll just wait until their hold runs out. And that costs taxpayers money. And it also, there's really good research about the fact that just putting somebody in jail for as little as 24 or 48 hours can, can completely destabilize their lives and result in them uh, committing another crime, losing their housing, losing their job. So many people work at a job such as a McDonald's where they don't have days off. And so if they are in jail, they are going to lose their job. So for a lot of those misdemeanors, they don't need to be crimes at all. Um, but for the ones where there does need to be some intervention, um, I don't think most of those people need to be charged uh, and that we could uh, rely upon uh, alternatives which are more about accountability uh, than punishment. Agree, and, and the next question, you, you've touched on this, Mary, but um, I'm gonna throw this to you, Nadine. Um, what changes in law are recommended by panelists regarding misdemeanors, also from Randy at Star Tribune? I think Mary hit on a lot of them um, as far as just decriminalizing things that shouldn't be criminal. Um, the petty thefts, those are, there's diversion programs that are available for that. Um, public intoxication, she already noted, just put up porta potties, you can avoid that. Um, trespassing individuals, there are restorative programs that you can put in to address the concerns that people actually have. The issue is, as Mary noted, there is disparities in who is getting policed. And so we could change all the laws that we want to change, but if people are still uncomfortable with seeing black youth together, there's nothing I can do about that until, unless you continue to do what the work that we all criminals is doing and exposing that and causing people to check themselves. And like, why am I uncomfortable with seeing black youth together, but I'm not uncomfortable at the new hope swimming pool where there's a bunch of white youth together, you know, similar stuff like that, I think is, is huge. Um, I think also decriminalizing marijuana, because I've seen that in too many cases where officers are saying, they're pulling someone over because of that substance, Substance, check the car and there's none of that substance in there. So it could very well be in the neighborhood someone was smoking, but why is that a reason where you're pulling somebody over when there's no driving conduct? There's nothing, no other reason for you to pull them over. So I think those would be my starts on changes in the law. Thank you. Uh, before I close, is there anything anyone else wants to mention in response to any of those questions or that's come to mind from any of the other panelists? Chris? Yep, yep. Uh, yeah, I read this question. Uh, you know, I'm not too astute as far as law goes, right? But I do believe um, having armed officers um, approach people who have petty misdemeanors, like, you know, theft and things like that, it's, it's overkill, right? Like, and, and having warrants on, on the top of that, like, you know, it just gives them way too much leeway to 
completely destroy someone's life, right? So decriminalizing some of the some of these misdemeanors, I think would is definitely necessary, but also having I don't feel like we need armed people accosting someone who isn't a threat that deserves or needs to, you know, have a, a firearm in the vicinity, right? Like certain crimes don't need that much uh, energy. So I feel like it's overkill, right? So I, I feel like the police officers could really change by having, I don't know the word to use, but like a community person in the car with them, right? Like we don't need two officers armed to the teeth in the, in the community all the time, right? Like just having someone with them, like for mediation, you know what I'm saying? I feel like that would be much better as opposed to them using these misdemeanors to basically perpetuate racism. I mean, it's just the simplest way to do it, right? So, and now that a light is being shined on it and, and people are actually seeing like, this is what it's created for. So, you know, we have to change the minds and the hearts, but also we have to change so how they interact with these laws and the people that are quote unquote breaking these, you know, misdemeanor laws or whatever, so. That's right. Yeah, the only thing I would add, and that might just be the academic in me, is I think it's also really important, in addition to everything excellent that everybody has already stated, that we continue to try to gather the data, right, and to make sure we have the information about who's getting arrested, where they're getting arrested, where are police officers targeting their attention, how are they targeting it, where are how are prosecutors making decisions about which cases to go forward, what plea offers are, are being um, extended, how are probation officers handling their probation, uh, their probation needs, like, like all of that stuff, all that data, I think is really important for us. Um, one of my areas of interest is really how, how we can learn from the mistakes of the past. And, and part of the way you do that is really understanding what you have and what's, what's, what's in existence. I think that's a great point. I know the Hennepin County Public Defender's Office does a tremendous job on collecting that data and using that data in their litigation. So I just want to highlight that and commend them to continue to do so. I think it's an excellent way to educate the bench. You educate the prosecutors and hopefully if the case makes it to trial, you're educating the jurors on what they're seeing. Um, you know, as in Minneapolis, as um, Chris mentioned earlier, or in Minnesota, the demographics are very low for people of color. But when you walk in the courtroom, you would think that that only black people or East African people are the one committing the crimes when the numbers just don't show that. And so I just want us just to um, highlight that that's a great point on keeping track of the data. That's right. Okay. Um, well, I think we're gonna close up. I wanna thank everyone so much for joining us today. Um, especially to all of the speakers and um, thanks for lending your voice to this film. And uh, I wanna remind everyone who's watching at home that this film is available for free to watch on YouTube and Facebook. And you can also sign up to host a screening at misdemeanorfilm.org and you'll receive a download of the film and a discussion guide that you can use to have conversations about this issue. And also want to remind everyone that if you have a screening, you can also request a free copy of the book by Alexandra Natapoff, Punishment Without Crime. This is the book again that this uh, film, this film was inspired by this book. And um, I guess the, the main thing going forward is the film is done, but now the real work begins. So I invite you to join all the co-sponsors um, from these local organizations, We Are Criminals, Minnesota Freedom Fund, and the ACLU of Minnesota. Go to their websites, learn more, educate yourself, and get involved. Thank you so much. Thanks to everybody.